Thank you. The next item of business is the continuation of the debate on the First Minister's statement. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, it's my pleasure to open the second uh, part of the debate that we've had on the First Minister's statement. And I think one of the observations that I think can be made safely about the debate that we had yesterday is that in the aftermath of the result of the referendum, no matter uh, the disappointment that those of us who um, were on the yes side of the campaign feel, and how exhilarated those on the no side uh, feel about the result, there is a general accepted conclusion that the whole process of the referendum, the engaged debate, the level of participation by members of the public, the legislative agreement around the holding of the referendum through the Edinburgh Agreement between the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government created the conditions in which Scotland could have a full, open and engaged debate about the constitutional future of the country. And the outcome of the referendum uh, debate um, has been a credit to Scotland in the way in which the debate has been conducted on all sides of the argument. And there are so many strengths uh, that come out of that debate in terms of the level of voter registration, the level of participation, the level of turnout, and particularly, I think, uniformly accepted across this chamber, the credit that the participation of 16- and 17-year-old voters were to the process that Scotland can uh, look to the referendum as an example of the democratic process that has taken place to the highest possible standard uh, here in Scotland. We now find ourselves in the aftermath of the referendum looking forward, looking ahead to what comes next uh, in Scotland. And I want to confirm to Parliament uh, that yesterday afternoon the Deputy First Minister and I met with uh, Lord Smith of Kelvin to confirm, as we have confirmed publicly, that the Scottish Government and the Scottish National Party will participate fully in the process that is being taken forward by Lord Smith in trying to secure agreement around the additional powers and responsibilities that will come to Scotland in the aftermath of the referendum. Lord Smith, I think, quite fairly said yesterday that his task is not an easy one. And I think it's important to consider at the outset of that process just the issues that Lord Smith has got to resolve. The Prime Minister said during the referendum, if people vote no, Business as usual is not on the ballot paper. The status quo is gone. The campaign has swept it away. There is no going back to things the way they were. A vote for no means real change. Gordon Brown said, the plan for a stronger Scottish Parliament we seek agreement on is for nothing else than a modern form of Scottish home rule within the United Kingdom. He's also quoted as saying, we're going to be within a year or two as close to a federal state as you can be in a country where one nation is 85% of the population. And just for completeness, Danny Alexander said, Scotland will have more powers over its finances, more responsibility for raising taxation, and more control over parts of the welfare system. Effective home rule, but within the security and the stability of our successful United Kingdom. So those are the solemn commitments that were made to people in advance of the referendum last Thursday. And what we are engaged in, and what we're happy to be engaged in, is a process of dialogue over which uh, Lord Smith will preside to bring together an agreement that lives up to the expectations that were set out in all of those statements. And of course, those statements, in a whole number of different ways, go way beyond the proposals and the propositions that were put forward by the three unionist parties well in advance of the referendum. And indeed, uh, Mr Brown's comments, uh, Gordon Brown's comments about the taking us within a year or two to a position of being as close to a federal state is dramatically different to the proposals that his own party put forward prior to the referendum and I think sets an important benchmark of the type and level of agreement that has to be secured if there is to be a faithful commitment delivered to those who in good faith voted no on the expectation that additional significant powers were going to be devolved to the Scottish <coughs> Parliament. Uh, I was encouraged... 
Of course, yes. <coughs> I am grateful to him. I welcome his commitment to participate fully in the process. Does he think, though, that the process should be judged at the end of the process instead of negative comments being made by some before the process has even begun? Well, I don't, I, I, I don't know why Mr Brown feels the need to raise that with me. I am the epitome of positivity <laughs> in all my contributions to this debate. I, have, I, I thought... I thought Mr Brown would have moved on from his narrative before the referendum. Uh, so uh, we're all positive now, Mr Brown. We're all positive now. Um, so uh, on my, 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 next, my next positive remark was going to be that I welcome the remit that Lord Smith, uh, or the terms of reference that Lord Smith published yesterday, in which he said he is to facilitate an inclusive engagement process across Scotland to produce by the end of November heads of agreement with recommendations for de further devolution of powers to this Scottish Parliament. And the key word in there is inclusive. We have excited, and my goodness, imagine the word being excited being used alongside politics and Parliament. We have excited a tremendous amount of democratic engagement, as the presiding officer properly said to us as we commenced our proceedings yesterday. The real test is can we capture the enthusiasm, the ambition and the energy that was represented by that mammoth turnout in the referendum and ensure that the settlement that is proposed by Lord Smith captures those ambitions and puts them forward in a fashion that can give confidence to people in Scotland that despite the fact that my side of the argument was unsuccessful last Thursday, the powers of this parliament have been decisively enhanced for real purpose to enable us to address the challenges and the issues that face the people of our country. Thank you. I now call Lewis MacDonald. Six minutes, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. Last week's referendum was indeed the biggest exercise of popular sovereignty in Scotland's history. As John Swinney has just said, record numbers of people registered to vote and record numbers took part. I met some inspiring voters who were born a century and more ago when only adult male householders over the age of 21 had the right to vote and who were determined that their voices should be heard. Many other voters, like my younger daughter Iona, were born in the last 17 years after we agreed in our last referendum that there should be a Scottish Parliament. Each and every vote in last week's referendum was of equal value. And in response to the question of whether Scotland should be an independent country, a clear majority voted no. Scotland and England have shared a common head of state and head of government for over 400 years. We have shared a common parliament for more than 300. Last week, for the first time, the whole people of Scotland were invited to vote on whether or not to sustain that union. And we, the people of Scotland, have determined for ourselves that our country should continue as part of one United Kingdom. The two million people who voted no were not as has been suggested merely the largest minority in an electorate divided among no voters, yes voters and non voters. They were rather a clear majority of those who chose to take part. Alex Salmond yesterday described the Scottish Assembly referendum of 1979 as a botched job because non voters were counted as if they were against the majority view, with the result that the side which gained most votes was unable to have its wishes put into effect. Those who lost the vote last week should not make the same mistake as was made in 1979, and they should accept the result as the sovereign will of the people of Scotland expressed by a clear majority of those who chose to exercise their sovereign rights. And the idea of popular sovereignty has deep roots in Scottish history. The community of the realm in the 1300s or the 1600s was a much smaller and more limited elite than the mass electorate of today, or even the electorate of 1914. But the point about popular sovereignty is that it is the final word. Those who support the sovereignty of the people must not then pick apart the results to find a narrative that suits them better. Two million people voted for Scotland to stay in the Union, and they did so because, in their judgment, that was the best direction for Scotland to take. They were not gulled or tricked into making that judgment, nor did they do so only in response to the issues that got most attention in the short campaign. Polish voters in Aberdeen, for instance, voted for Scotland to remain in the UK for much the same reasons as most other Aberdonians voted no. They too value the benefits of Scotland. I will give way in a moment. They too value the benefits of Scotland's membership of the wider British Union. 
The claim made yesterday that polls voted no through fear is an insult to their intelligence and a slur on the integrity of those who argued that these nations are better together. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the member for giving way. There were many, many polls in Aberdeen who were threatened uh, by no campaigners saying that they would be deported if there was a yes vote. It was so severe that the yes campaign wrote to many Polish voters. Does Mr Macdonald deny that that happened? Lewis Mr McDonald Stewart would have done himself a favour by accepting the proposition that I put to him, that actually voters of whatever ethnic group and whatever national origin made a decision on the basis of the information in front of them and did so with an intelligent understanding of the issues at stake. Mr Stewart, stop And it is equally chamber. wrong to say that pensioners voted for the union only because they were misled or that they failed to take into account the interests of future generations. Denunciation of older voters should have no place in the discourse of a modern democratic society. The wisdom and experience of elders is highly valued in many cultures around the world, in part because older people think more than most about what the world will be like after they have gone. I believe it was precisely because of what they judged to be in the best interests of their children and grandchildren that so many older people voted for Scotland to stay in the British Union. And future generations, I think, will be grateful for their maturity and judgment in doing so. The truth is that all those who had a vote had a choice before them between independence and a self-governing Scotland within the UK. And over 55% of those who voted chose devolution and not independence. That majority included majorities in most age groups and most local council areas, but Scotland was for this purpose one constituency and the will of the Scottish people as a whole has been made clear. The commitments given by the Labour Party and other parties over recent weeks and months will lay the basis for future devolution, which will be delivered following next week's election. Alex Salmond said last week that he accepted the verdict of the people and called on everyone else who had campaigned for Scottish independence to do the same. I am glad that Nicola Sturgeon has made a commitment this morning to work with others on taking forward proposals for further devolution. I know how tough it can be to lose the vote at the end of a hard-fought campaign. It is easy to believe that you are entitled to win because you think you have made your case. It is easier still to go into denial or to look for somebody to blame when you fall at the final hurdle. But I think we all now need to accept and move on from last week's clear decision and to work together across parties to secure the kind of changes in our country that will make it an even better place in the future. I now call George Adam to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. One of the many uh, positive aspects of the campaign was the sheer level of engagement. Members of our communities engaged at all levels, whether it be social media, public meetings or the big television debates. People were extremely interested in this debate. And who wouldn't be interested in the biggest debate, most important debate Scotland has ever had? It was a busy campaign, regardless of whether you were yes or no. I'm quite sure that the energy drink sales probably went through the roof with many campaigners all the time, although I'm currently trying to get many members of Team Paisley off of that uh, kind of uh, addiction almost at this stage. But I'm glad to say that the people of Paisley voted yes. They are a yes town. Traditional working class areas wanted independence for Scotland, Glenbar, Foxbar, Paisley's East End and Fergusley Park. Traditionally low turnout numbers came out in massive numbers to vote for this type of radical change. And that's the type of engagement that we must embrace as politicians. We must ensure that these people still feel powerful and still want to actually engage because they felt their vote would make a difference. So my fellow buddies embraced this change and really wanted to go for something different in the future. Future. And I hope that the Westminster elite stick to that and remember that when they make their decisions. Because the many campaigning stories that we've all had and were mentioned yesterday had young men and women going to school, shaking their hands at the polling stations, 
congratulating us for the work we're doing. I had another young man walking through the streets who'd already been to the parliament shouting at one end, Georgie boy, it's Georgie boy, let's, let's talk to him. He was voting and he was telling me how he was voting. Matthew, who works for me, actually says, what other person, what other politician is actually treated that way in Paisley streets? I take it as a compliment myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> ah, very good. Someone else said there's no one else called George in Paisley. Uh, but also, there was another awkward moment when uh, a young uh, voter came up to me from Paisley Grammar and actually said, you know, she wanted to take a selfie, and while she was taking the picture, she says, I adore you, George. <laughs> I found that quite awkward and creepy at that stage, but it just shows you how the voters, the 16 and 17-year-olds, got engaged with the whole process. They became engaged with it. We even had a situation where young women from Paisley, the Paisley girls, spoke to Ed Miliband, uh, and Douglas Alexander regarding child poverty and they recorded it at the same time and they were asking Mr Miliband what about child poverty what about all the young people I'm voting for independence what can you offer me and my children for the future and he looked at her blankly Mr Miliband did and Douglas Alexander tried desperately tried desperately to explain and she said but well, you're paying for Trident and I can't get a house in Paisley. And this is the kind of issues and things that they were talking about. They saw independence as a way forward. We also had the Margot Mobile and Jim Stillers uh, coming out on a number of occasions, and it was great to campaign with them again. At one stage, it reminded me of my younger days in 1988, when I had Ian Lawson, Gil Patterson and uh, Jim Stillers all campaigning in what was the modern equivalent of a snappy bus. Uh, and it was really good to be in some of these areas, because we went to areas in Foxborough at Morrow Drive, which was bedecked in yes posters and everything else because again a low turnout area they were desperate to see that they could see this radical change but the sheer magnitude of the yes activists working with the SSP and the Green Party was absolutely fantastic you know there was one woman uh, came up to me and it was on the Saturday just after uh, the campaign and it was in my local bar and I was on my second pint by this time and she said George she says can you tell Alex Salmon the first minister that why did he give up because he was the person that convinced me, along with Nicola Sturgeon, to vote yes. So why are we at this stage to do that? And who can forget, who can forget the actual fact when we stood there in Paisley, where thousands of us walked through the streets Settle of Paisley, down. and we actually had uh, people walking through from all over the county in blue and white, saying with their yes banners, saying that they wanted the difference. They knew exactly what was happening and how important it was. But the thing we're doing locally is we're making sure that we engage with all these people that were part of that campaign. We have to keep them political. We have to make sure that they don't get fed up and they don't feel disenfranchised as the Westminster elite think it's business as usual and go back to their traditional games. Because we've almost had a situation where the Labour conference yesterday, it was almost as if, well, that didn't really happen. Let's just carry on with the Westminster's games. This isn't a game. This is people's lives we're dealing with here. And they quite clearly, whether they voted yes or no, they voted for change. And when you ask yourself, what happened to the vow? What happened to the actual vow? Well, let's talk about the vow. Surely it's not like a, a Lib Dem pledge. Surely it meant something. You know, the Scottish Parliament was meant to be a permanent and extensive new powers for the Parliament and will be delivered by the process and to a timetable agreed and announced by our three parties starting on the 19th of September. I think that timetable is a wee bit behind because things started changing as the morning of the 19th of September came round. Things started changing. And all I'm saying here is that Scotland demands change. My own constituency demands change. And they will be watching, along with myself, will be watching the Westminster establishment and the elite as they make these decisions over the next couple of years because they have to do something. And this is not, presiding officer, business as usual. Thank you, Mr Adam. About, after that story about your constituents' adoration, can I say there's no accounting for taste? Sandra White, followed by Gavin Brown. Oh. <laughs> Sandra White. <laughs> Presiding officer, is it OK to... <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I didn't want to interrupt you in your full flow there, and I'm sure that uh, uh, George Adam will perhaps uh, 
maybe a point of order a few words later on. I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. But uh, thank, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, can, I, can I just say that uh, it was absolutely great, fantastic to see so many people engaged in Scotland's future and uh, what it really meant to them. Uh, and I really want to thank all of them most sincerely for the, the work that they carried out from people belonging to political parties to people who were involved in none. Uh, local communities, Women for Indy, Radical Independence, Generation Yes, National Collective, Labour for Independence and so many more. And I apologise if I forgot uh, some. I can only say to them you were absolutely inspiring inspiring from pop-up cafes, which popped up from everywhere, obviously, street stalls, public meetings, debates taking place in pubs and buses and subways and streets. The place was alive, alive, and it was so compelling, and it was great to, to be absolutely part of it. Glasgow in particular was, was awash with the Yes campaigners, Yes window posters, events all conducted, and I really mean this, all conducted with great humour and positivity and confidence. And that was the one word, confidence. It was fantastic to watch and it was a resounding to say to people, please go out and vote and become engaged in that. And of course, Glasgow, in my home city, in my Kelvin constituency throughout Glasgow, we delivered a resounding yes for, for Scotland. And I'm very, very proud of that, very proud. Our job now is to continue this engagement with people to ensure that they continue to take part and become even more involved. And this is one of the central planks and the aims of the Yes campaign. It was to keep people involved then, and in particular, to push them forward and become involved as well. But I have to say to others, the genie is out of the bottle. It will not go back in. It is definitely out of the bottle. And we have to actually look at what we're going to do with the confidence that the people of Scotland put forward in this campaign particularly when we now see the vow which uh, so eloquently put forward and outlined by John Swinney a few minutes ago, is absolutely unravelling before our eyes. And how that could have been allowed to go forward when we have a purda, we had a purda of eight months, in three days before an election, they're allowed to come forward with these, what I would call, false promises. It's unravelling just now. And I hope that they'll work and it will come forward the Better Together parties will pay a heavy price for what they did during this campaign. And in fact, they're already paying a heavy price. There's word there that looks like the membership of the SNP in Scotland is greater than the membership of Labour, Tory and the Lib Dems in the whole of Scotland. They're paying the price already. Now, I want to, to turn to the actions of the No campaign, or should it be the Misinformation and Fear campaign? led in particular by the Labour Party. It's absolutely true. Frightening pensioners and vulnerable people, our own migrant communities, I honestly have never seen such a campaign and people stoop so low. Pensioners, here's a letter. Pensioners being told that they will not get their pension. They better stock up in food. And yet there's a letter here that I gave to all the pensioners groups from, from the, the ministry saying that nothing would happen. It reads out, if Scotland does become independent, it will have no effect on your state pension. Why was that not put forward in the media? Why did the TV companies not cover that? Why wasn't it? It was left up to activists to tell, to tell the pensioners, to tell the pensioners. I think that's absolutely disgraceful. Vulnerable people, people with learning difficulties on disability allowance, being told on their doorsteps that their allowance and their disability benefits would stop. Imagine stooping so low as to say that to vulnerable people. And that did happen on the doorstep. Polish migrants and others being told they no longer be able to stay in Scotland. How can you hold your heads up? How can you hold your heads up when you said that to people? You should be holding your head in shame. It wasn't a victory. It wasn't a victory. It was an absolute misinformation and you should be ashamed of yourself. And I say again, why wasn't this represented in the media? Why didn't they cover that? And I think that's something we really have to look at. And I thank the Sunday Herald for actually going out there and printing the truth of the matter. 
The rest of the media, I think, also have to look inward and look at themselves, the way they produced and projected this referendum. It wasn't a fair referendum when there was mis and misinformation and fear going out. And in fact, I've had pensioners coming to me now saying they were. They were, no, I won't take an intervention. I won't take an intervention. Now, we've got the result we had. And yes, campaign, I said this to the many, many young activists who were hanging their heads on Friday morning at the count. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You worked as hard as possible. The Yes campaign was a fantastic campaign. These people here are the ones that have to look. They did nothing. They relied on the fear and the British state to do their work for them. And that will come back and haunt them. Thank you, President Officer. I now call Gavin Brown, followed by Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to make a, a forward-looking uh, and constructive contribution to the debate today. And I'll start by saying I genuinely welcomed uh, the speech by John Swinney, both what he said and the tone in which Mr Swinney said it. And he said quite clearly that the Scottish Government intended to participate fully in the process with Lord Smith, Smith of Kelvin. I welcome that entirely. I think that's the right approach. He also said, though, that we are all positive now. And I have to say, the last couple of contributions we have heard completely contradicted that statement. Now, he has no control, of course, over the speeches that have just been made. But I think it's really important, really important, that if we are all, as Scotland and the UK, to get the most out of this process, it needs goodwill and it needs the best endeavours of all unionist parties and the Scottish Government and the Green Party and indeed Civic Scotland and the people of Scotland. I think John Swinney in particular has a great deal to add to this process via his experience under LBTT, his experience under landfill tax and his experience under so far the Scottish rate of income tax. And it's critical that the Scottish Government mean what they say when they say they're going to participate fully. That does mean, presiding officer, we can't affect what was said at the weekend what was said over the course of this week, and even indeed what's been said this afternoon. But I do think it's important the Scottish Government stands by what Mr Swinney said and actually don't snipe from the sidelines on the process and criticise it before it has begun. If they don't like the outcome, in a second, if they don't like the outcome, if they don't think the process over time has delivered, then I'm sure they will say so. But to criticise it and to say that it's not delivering before it has started I think is quite wrong, and I think it's critical that they do put everything in. I'll give way to, to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I, th I thank the member for giving way. Could he clarify for us or assure us that uh, once the three parties at Westminster have reached an agreement as to what powers should be devolved, they would then be willing to negotiate on that position, and it would not be a fixed position which the SNP or the government would have to accept? John, John, John Mason has seen exactly what I've seen over the course of the last week. Within an hour of the referendum result being obvious, the Prime Minister made a formal statement to the country and appointed the hugely respected Lord Smith of Kelvin, a man respected by the Scottish Government for his work in youth unemployment, which led to the appointment of Angela Constance, for his work with the Commonwealth Games, but equally respected by the UK Government for his work with the Green Investment Bank. He's made it clear from his statement yesterday. He's speaking to the five uh, largest parties within Scotland, but he intends to go outside the political process in terms of forming views and then ultimately a recommendation. I think we should all welcome that. And again, I have to say it's really important, I think, if this process is to succeed, if it has any prospect of delivering for Scotland, then everybody has to get on board and we mustn't snipe from the sidelines before the process has fully begun. Now, presenting officer, the other message I really wanted to push forward today is this. The eyes of the world were on Scotland last week, but actually I think the eyes of the world are still on Scotland, and they'll be on Scotland for the foreseeable future. And I think it's really important that the Scottish Government, in early course, makes it very, very clear that Scotland is open for business. There has been uncertainty over the last couple of months. We have had some investment decisions put on hold as a result of the referendum, and it's critical. Which ones? There was one in the Edinburgh Evening News yesterday, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the Point Hotel in Edinburgh, where there was a specific clause in the contract that the sale of that hotel uh, would go ahead only in the result 
of e novo. That's just one example. We know, of course, from the property market, a number of property sales again had referendum clauses within them. So we know that investment in some cases has been put on hold. And I think it would be better for the Cabinet Secretary to make it very clear that Scotland is open for business instead of questioning some of the facts and evidence that is actually out there. We've heard statements from business in the last couple of days. It's now in standard life. It's now important that we all move forward with respect and work together constructively in the best interests of Scotland and the United Kingdom. Philip Shaw of Investec, north of the border, it will be important for the Scottish Government to assuage the business community there to neutralise any risks that the Indus debate tempted some companies to re-domicile or transfer some of their options, operations to England or Wales. I don't know who's closing for the Scottish Government today, but I would welcome a formal statement from them that Scotland is open for business and they will do all in their power to help our economy grow. Because more than ever, the economic growth has a direct impact on the Scottish Government's budget. Whether it's the Land and Buildings minute. Transaction Tax coming into force in April of next year, whether it's the Scottish Rate of Income Tax coming into force in 2016, there will be a direct impact on our budget if we get this wrong going forward. And perhaps one way the Scottish Government uh, could begin, as my final point, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, is this. Every year that I've been a member of this Parliament, the first meeting after the summer recess has had a programme for government. The very first act of the Scottish Government has been to stand up and to tell the Chamber and Scotland at large what bills are happening over the course of the next year and what the government plan is for the next year. As far as I'm aware, we don't have a programme of government this week. As far as I'm aware, we don't have a programme for government next week. The week after that, I don't think business has been finalised, but I think it's critical the government tells us today when will we have a programme for government so that everyone can see that Scotland is genuinely open for business. Many thanks. Now I call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, perhaps in response to uh, uh, Gavin Brown, um, I wonder, did we actually believe that Scotland was closed for business? Because uh, my recall, Mr Brown, is that we've had record high invest, inward investment in Scotland over the past year. We had record investment in oil and gas. That's not closed for business. Scotland has been open for business and Scotland remains open for business, Mr Brown. I heard Ross Martin this morning from the SCDI saying that the government should work together. Um, my understanding is that Scotland didn't stop working with the Westminster government. Perhaps Westminster government had closed its ears to the needs of, the Scot of Scotland and Scot uh, Scotland's people. Um, I, I can I associate myself with the comments from the Cabinet Secretary this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, because again, I endorse everything he said. But I'm just wondering, Mr Macdonald, um, when his contribution, I, I was slightly concerned about the tone because he's asking us to work together. He's asking to, to put aside you know, our differences. He was asking us to accept the result, and to which I do. But I always felt that you know, what he was saying um, and, and his tone, and, and the fact that you know, when Mr. Um, Stewart, my colleague and friend here, um, asked him about the, uh, the accusations with regard to the uh, Polish immigrants within Aberdeen, um, Mr. Macdonald would not deny that, 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 that actually there had been a fear campaign within Aberdeen. Now, I would not subscribe to any fear campaign or, or any such behaviour at all. Presiding officer, I've come back to this uh, chamber um, enthused and excited, but I was actually enthused and excited before I left for the Purda period. And part of that was because the, the um, EET committee had a fantastic session of inviting not just politicians, but Civic Scotland and people from all industries talking about their aspirations for Scotland, whether it be a yes or no vote at the end of the day. So we were energised, we were excited, and I believe I still am. And part of that presiding officer is because that Scotland, the people of Scotland came out in their droves. 85% of the people wanted to take part in that decision-making process. And the 16 to 17 year olds who came out for the first time, I think energized and enthused perhaps many, many, many more people. 
They perhaps encouraged many of their parents to come out and vote again, maybe for the first time. I was in the Contour uh, uh, polling office and two young girls in their school uniforms came out skipping, singing. They had been voting for the first time. I have no idea, presiding officer, which way they voted. But their enthusiasm, their excitement was something to behold. And another polling station, I was advised that a gentleman had come in and had voted for the first time. He was 66. Again, I have no idea which way he'd actually voted. But he felt compelled to come out in, in this occasion to vote. Presiding officer, we have a lot to be proud of. We should be proud of our people. Our people came out and they actually came out to, to, to vote and to take Scotland forward. Because it is a Scotland for change. It is a Scotland that has go, it will go in a different direction. And, presiding officer, can I say to yourself and to this chamber that I'm not a narrow-minded nationalist. I don't believe I ever have been a narrow-minded nationalist. I believe I am someone who has great vision for this country. I believe I am someone who has a vision for the future of this country and for the people of Scotland. I believe that the constituency that I represent has a, a enormous potential for Scotland. And within the northeast of Scotland, the oil and gas industry, the renewables, we are world leaders, presiding officer. And can I say that, you know, I come from a very mixed constituency. There is great affluence within the constituency I represent. And yes, I represent Royal Deeside. And I have no idea what Her Majesty was actually thinking with regard to the referendum, despite what Mr Cameron says at the end of the day. But, presiding officer, I've also got parts of my constituency which is not so affluent. And those areas, I think, were looking towards Scotland and looking towards, I think, the Yes campaign to give them self-belief and perhaps an opportunity to move forward too. I was enthused. I was excited during the campaign. I remain enthused and excited because I believe we have an opportunity to move forward. And it's not that we are better together, presiding officer. We are better when we work uh, for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John McAlpine. Uh, presiding officer, many speakers have emphasised there is a great deal to celebrate in what has happened in Scotland in the last uh, few weeks, particularly the turnout and the level of the political uh, engagement. But, uh, but I do have some regrets, and I'll only mention one because I don't really want to dwell on the past, but I do regret the polarisation that we saw. It was to some extent inevitable, but I do think it was intensified by the tendency to invent the enemy rather than respect the other side. Now, what do I mean by that? I suppose, from my point of view, one of the things that particularly annoyed me was the way that some, I'm not saying all, some Yes supporters uh, took upon themselves the mantle of social justice and thought it was their exclusive preserve and therefore accused many people on the other side of voting out of uh, selfish purposes, perhaps, or for their own interests. Whereas I think respect would have required the recognition that we too believed we were, what we were doing was in the interests of social justice and equality. We just thought there was a different way of achieving it. Now, I'm, I give way to John Mason. John Mason. Accept, accepting what the member says, but would he accept that on the whole it was richer areas voting no and poorer areas voting yes? Well, Welcome I think that's an overgeneralisation. I'm going to come on to that point. But the, uh, I, I'm not absolving my own side from also sometimes uh, misrepresenting the other side. But I think we should let the past be the past. There it is, immutable. What we should concentrate on now is the future, creating a future which does not exist, but which will, will be determined by the decisions that we make. So now I think is the time for respect, for abandoning polarisation and coming together as much as possible, and certainly for nurturing the culture uh, of participation and involvement that uh, was boosted so much by the referendum campaign. And in that context, I do welcome much 
of what Nicola Sturgeon said uh, this morning. I send her my best wishes. I was going to say a few other nice things about her, which she may not have welcomed, but since she's abandoned the debate, I'll leave that for another day. Uh, I do want to mention one concern, however, that I have about what Nicola Sturgeon did say this morning, and that is that she refused to rule out a referendum in the next Parliament. Now, that is completely contrary, not just to what the First Minister, the present First Minister, said during the campaign, but also what she said uh, about this being a decision for a generation. So it seems this morning that a political generation may have become a mere five years. I was hoping that Nicola Sturgeon would respond to that point in the wind-up that I thought she was going to make, but it may well be that somebody else is going to do that. Now, the two big issues for us uh, looking forward are the new powers that we will, uh, that we will receive uh, and, of course, how to make use, not just of those powers, but of the powers that we currently have. And very important as the new powers are, I think even more important and urgent, is how we use all the powers that we will soon have. I know, and this responds in part to the point that John Mason made, that many people in the communities that I hold most dear did vote yes. Not, by no means all, but many, many of them did. And they were doing that, I believe, basically in the hope of more uh, social justice. And I believe that the challenge for us is to start delivering uh, on that social justice with the powers we have now and the powers that we will soon acquire. Why, for example, is it that there is not a poverty and inequality assessment of all the policies and all the legislation that we do in this Parliament? I give way to Dennis Robertson. Dennis Robertson. I, I thank the member very much for that brief intervention. Um, uh, I, I understand what you're saying, uh, Mr Chisholm, but we don't have the powers to uh, change welfare reform, which is impacting on some of our most vulnerable people in society at the moment. Malcolm Chisholm. Yes, but what I regret is that all we hear about in relation to the debate about social and justice and equality is what we cannot do, whereas we need to concentrate far more on what we can do. And there is no doubt, uh, I've just, I made the general point, but, uh, I give way to John Swinney. John Swinney. I, I'm grateful to Mr Chisholm for giving me. I, I'm a bit surprised by his remarks about the lack of a qualities assessment, given that he knows that on an annual basis I publish an equalities impact assessment of all of the government's budget measures, which su summarise the entirety of public expenditure under our control. I, I, of course, I know that, but there is not a focus on poverty and income uh, inequality, and that's really what I was uh, referring to in that remark. And just to give one other example, much as I support uh, more devolution to local government in general, why are there not uh, more national initiatives uh, for combating poverty and disadvantage, such as the Fairer Scotland Fund, which, of course, the current uh, government uh, abolished? So certainly issues of social justice and equality are going to be my number one priority for my last 18 months in this parliament. I know that they will be the number one priority of the Labour group in this parliament, and I hope they will become the number one priority of the Scottish Government. One minute left to deal with powers. Two things, therefore, I will say. Firstly, there is a clear timetable, and contrary to what Sandra White uh, said, uh, there will be delivery in accordance with that uh, timetable. Secondly, though, and this is something I've noted in the comments of many uh, Yes supporters in the last few days, what was promised by the leaders, and indeed by Gordon Brown, was not Devo Max. And I can see some people are trying to set this up as, if it's not Devo Max, they have reneged on their promise. They never promised Devo Max. You know Gordon Brown doesn't support Devo Max. Everybody knows that uh, none of the uh, Better Together parties support Devo Max. Devo Max doesn't exist anywhere in the world. But what I will say, what I will say Order. is I, my final words, I certainly support extensive fiscal and other powers coming to this parliament. And I, in fact, may not be entirely satisfied with the level uh, of devolution that is delivered, but I will certain, certainly welcome it. Devolution is a process, not an event, a process that we can continue because of the no vote last week. And what I know is that in the very near future, we will have the start of a semi-autonomous state within a fiscally federal UK, and I hope everyone in this chamber will welcome that. Thank you very much. Now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Christian Allard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I, like others, congratulate all those who participated in the democratic process, whichever way they voted? Most of my speech today will, in fact, focus on the two million Scots who voted no. But can I start by saying thank you to the 1.6 million Scots who voted yes and who went to the polls with hope in their hearts? And I am truly sorry that those hopes were dashed. 
I welcome Lord Smith's appointment and I implore him to remember that 1.6 million or 45 per cent. He must also include the wider grassroots yes campaign in his discussions, not just political parties. I would like to now draw attention to my register of members' interests as I write a column for the Daily Record, which published the now infamous vow by the leader of, leaders of the three main unionist parties before the vote. Now, the vow was, in fact, presented as offering substantial powers to the Scottish uh, Parliament. Um, surveys like the 2013 Scottish Social Attitude Survey show that 63% of Scots favour either independence or the devolution of all powers except defence and foreign affairs. And that's what the vow was sold as delivering. The Daily Record itself said, quote, all three UK party leaders are now committed to offering devomax powers to Scotland. And the Edinburgh Evening News, which serves a city where the no vote was above the national average, said, vote no and we get more say in our own affairs through Devo Max. Other papers made similar statements. The vow had an effect, as did the intervention of former Prime Minister Gordon Brown a week earlier. We know this from the Ashcroft poll of 2,000 voters conducted on the 18th and 19th of September, which found that one in four who voted no did so mainly because they believed more powers were coming to the Scottish Parliament. Yes. I'm, thank Joe McAlpin for giving me. I'm absolutely sure that substantial more powers will come. She's quoted newspapers. Can she support, quote any of the politicians involved at that time who used the words Devo Max? Joe McAlpin. Well, Gordon Brown, um, Gordon Brown said in his speech to the Lonehead Miners' Welfare on Monday the 8th of September, um, the status quo is no longer an option. He said his, his proposal was like home rule in the UK. We'd be mo moving quite close to something near to federalism in a country where 85% of the population is from one nation. And the author and Better Together donor, Joanne Rowling, clearly believed that she was putting her money on Devo Max. On the 6th of September, she tweeted about the, the fact that she would back anyone who delivered Devo Max. And on the 10th of September, she tweeted to her 3.7 million followers on Twitter, in the event of a no vote, we're being offered home rule plus the economic advantages of the union. So whether you call it home rule, Devo Max or federalism, this offer goes well beyond existing offers by the unionist parties. Now, um, Malcolm Chisholm says there's no example of Devo Max in, in the world. Certainly in Europe, it's, um, it's regarded that the Basque country um, has a system of Devo Max. Um, the regional governments there raise and retain their own revenue and give a quota back to Madrid to cover defence and foreign affairs. And the word Fed federalism has been used too. So let's look at examples of that system. For example, Alberta in Canada has access to a share of its oil revenues, as do Texas and Alaska in the United States. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act uh, stipulates that 37.5% of all revenues from offshore oil in the Gulf states um, are shared with those states, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi and Texas. Uh, and of course Scotland gets none of its oil revenue and none of the unionist parties plan to offer us a share. Um, but it was not just the vow in Gordon Brown that influenced no voters. The Ashcroft poll shows that the biggest reasons for voting no were concerns about economic well-being. And throughout the campaign, the UK Treasury produced material claiming that we would be, be better economically, better off in the UK. As I recall, the figure for this union dividend used by Danny Alexander was £1,400 a head. Now, of course, we on the Yes side disputed that figure, but I don't want to rerun the arguments of the referendum campaign. But I do want to say that the union dividend depends on the Barnett formula remaining in place. And the Barnett formula, let us not forget, was a sop to Scots in the 1970s designed to compensate us for the loss of our oil revenues. The only way that Barnett could be scrapped in a way that would not leave Scotland wor worse off would be via true Devo Max. That means 100% allocation of the taxes raised here in Scotland. Now, last December, the Prime Minister wrote to the First Minister to dismiss suggestions of any threat to Barnet. And the vow also said that the Barnet formula would remain in place. That was a repetition of promises made by Better Together politicians at every level of the campaign. And I can recall lots of local debates I had with David Mundell when he accused me of scaremongering when I suggested there was a threat to Barnet. Now, this week, the Times newspaper has quoted Downing Street as saying Barnet will not be retained in its current form, and Tory and Labour MPs are lining up to demand that Scotland's funding is cut. 
Without Barnet or True Devo Max, there is no union dividend and we could lose £4 billion a year from our budget forcing us to raise taxes to make up the shortfall. If that happens, thousands of people will have been misled into casting a vote for no. The unionist parties in this chamber now have a moral obligation to stand by their promises to the electorate. And if they fail to break their solemn vows and promises, then in the words of Billy Conley, there will be hell to pay. Thank you very much. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by Dr Lynn Murray. President Officer, here we are. Six days have already passed since we, the people who live here, voted no to Scotland becoming an independent country. This is very important to testify this. We, the people who live here in Scotland, voted no. 55%, a majority of the people voted no. We voted no. And yet, presenting officer, the side of the chamber uh, seems to be, uh, after the, the, the statement of the first minister yesterday and the cabinet secretary today, the side of the chamber seems to be serene, positive, and full of energy. While the other political parties who decided to campaign against independence look deflated and unhappy. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that a resigning first minister would have a spring in his step? The Northeast MSP is this Northeast MSP is as positive about the future as the Aberdeenshire East MSP are sharing office with. Presenting officer, I witness how much the member of Aberdeenshire East is loved across the Northeast, to a point that campaigning with him the last few weeks in his constituency in Inverary, Taraf, Elon, Newmarket can only be described as a huge flash mob. People voting yes or no, SNP or others, all wanted to thank the First Minister for giving us the opportunity to rediscover democracy. I could not do it, I could not do it yesterday, so I'll do it today. I would like to add my personal thanks to Alex Salmon, our leader, the man who changed Scotland forever, and more importantly, for the better. I look forward to work alongside the MSP for Albinshire East as long as he stops going on about his successful Beyoncé diet. <laughs> Presenting officer, people of the Northeast won't be surprised to hear, but I also look forward to join the hashtag Team Sturgeon. Nicola Sturgeon came many times to the Northeast, filled the room of more than 300 people in Inverurie, who ran out of chairs. We camping in Stonehaven together with Nigel Dawn and Maureen Watt, Maureen Watt MSP when we ran out of umbrellas. Nicola Sturgeon stopped in Aberdeen on Union Street to support all the groups for yes that emerged in this campaign. Again, just like with our First Minister, our Deputy First Minister ran out of time to speak to everyone who came to greet her. Who in the new campaign can claim to have received such a welcome? David Cameron, Ed Miliband, or John Lamont knew better not to be seen in the streets of the northeast of Scotland. I look forward to our new incoming, incoming First Minister's many visits to the North East. I'm immensely proud of the campaign in the North East, a campaign that not only energised people, but empowered them. Mark Macdonald, MSP, spoke yesterday about coins for Indy, and I agree with him. Gillian Martin and her sister Lindsay and many more North East women made a fantastic contribution to this campaign. I read online that uh, Gillian Martin will be featured in a document and then you win, on how the people of Scotland, and women in particular, have built the biggest grassroots campaign Scotland has seen in living memory. Other groups made a massive contribution in the campaign reaching people who, we, politicians, have failed to reach over the years. National Collective has been a revelation to many, a revelation that politics should not be left to politicians. Ross, David and Alex from my wee town of West Hill were at the forefront of the movement who challenged us to imagine a better Scotland. This generation, yes, is not going anywhere. We are not going back to eat the cereals. Lastly, I mention, if I may, presenting officer, for the many people who have been active on both sides of the debate the last two years. I'm proud to have shared the platform in the many public meetings I, have, uh, I was asked to participate in with Kenny Anderson from Business for Scotland, a group who is uh, keeping going after uh, Thursday. Articulate, facts in hands, and so inspiring, Kenny, just like Gillian and many of us, will make a real difference sitting in this chamber. And I dare say, a fantastic contribution on the green benches of Westminster as early as next year. Online in the street, at public meetings, at the doorstep, 
at work or at home, the debate has been electrifying. And I understand why the people of Scotland never want to feel disenfranchised with politics again. We have shown the world, with this fantastic turnout of 3.6 million people, that for democracy to stay alive, it must be exercised. More powers for Scotland is a must. And my vote is to the two million of us who voted no, of us who voted no, who voted no for more powers from Westminster, and that I will do all I can to get those powers. As for the many disenfranchised people in England who don't have a voice, my advice to them, President Officer, is to choose a candidate that will empower them with policies like extending the right to vote to 16 and 17 years old in the 2015 general election, as early as this, and also to people like me, EU nationals living here, staying in the UK. Some of you will know that I don't have a vote for next year's elections. And, of course, to support a candidate with other policies like getting rid of Trident or to address the democratic deficit in the UK by establishing an English parliament similar to this one. We all have a voice, most of us have a vote, use it and become what you want to be. It seems that today what everyone wants to be in Scotland is to be a member of the SNP. The summer of independence may be over, but the age of self-determination has only just begun. We watched on our TV the Arab Spring, the world witnessed the Scottish summer, let's encourage the rest of the people in the Western world to engage with politics like never before. Thank you. I call on Dr. Lane Murray to be followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2011, 61,964 electors cast their votes in the parliamentary constituencies of Dumfrieshire and Galloway and West Dumfries. Last week, 106,653 people cast their votes in the referendum, 87.5% of the registered electorate, of which 70,039 voted for Scotland, remaining part of the United Kingdom. So more people in Dumfries and Galloway voted no than voted for all the parties in the last Scottish parliamentary elections. Our sampling at the count suggests that in the Dumfries constituency, support for no ran at over 70%. Not surprising, considering the closest to the border or our links with Carlisle, which, as I've said in previous speeches, is our closest city and the city to which we look for work, leisure transport, and transport connectivity. Joan McAlpine. Joan McAlpine. She also accepts that the, um, the, the gap between Dumfries and Galloway and the national average for the yes vote actually closed from 1997 by eight points. We're actually eight points closer to the national average for a yes vote than we were in 97. 97. I think the vote in 1997 was rather different from the vote uh, this year. Uh, over the many months of the campaign, it had become clear to me that the majority of my constituents supported remaining part of the United Kingdom, not because they were scared, but because they could see positive ben benefits from membership of the United Kingdom and our close association with Cumbria and Carlisle. The changes which could come through de increased devolution to, uh, to a local level, both in Scotland and England, can lead to better cooperation across the Solway Basin and the economic de development which would benefit both sides of the border. When the First Minister announced his resignation on Friday, I felt he had taken the honourable course, notwithstanding his references to feet, holding feet to the fire, which I find rather an unpleasant analogy. I believe it cannot have been an easy decision for him, and although I strongly disagree with his views on the best constitutional arrangements for Scotland, no one can doubt the sincerity of his passion for his country. And of course, I will miss at First Minister's questions, being told that I will be the first person to welcome some success of the SNP government. I expect uh, Ms Sturgeon will develop her own put-down lines. Some of his statements since then and, and others have caused me greater concern. And I think there have been a lot of assertions made about how different sections of Scottish society voted, many based on Lord Ashcroft's post-referendum poll. Now, some of that data is based on very small samples. Only 14 16- and 17-year-olds and only 84 18- to 24-year-olds, for example. So I really doubt that much credibility can be attached to those results. And I also appreciate that supporters of independence are extremely disappointed and angered by last week's result. This has been clear, I have to say, from some of the contributions to this debate, and indeed actually from the torrent of abuse I've received on social media for suggesting that actually we could work together in Scotland. However, I, I also find that the fact that people, people are being blamed Certain sections of the electorate are being blamed for the result. Older voters, for example. I find that disturbing. Like uh, Lewis MacDonald, over the months when I have spoken to 
voters over 55 and over 65. They have thought long and hard about how they should vote on the basis of what was the best thing for their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, not what was best for them. Briefly. Okay. I that I think we all want to move on, but in terms of the scaremongering tactics that led people to those decisions, can Elaine Murray remind us, surely aware of the pension, the DWP pension guarantee letter, just how many better together billboards, billboards says don't put your pension at risk? Elaine well, Murray. I have never scaremongered anybody, and I respect it all through this campaign. I respected the views of people who disagreed with me, even if they didn't respect my views. And can I also say, with regard to 16 and 17 year olds, uh, voting in elections, the Labour has already agreed to this. And I think actually the referendum demonstrated why these pe young people should permanently join, us, join the franchise. Because the engagement of 16 and 70 year olds, whether it was through the school hustings or in the streets or in polling day itself, was encouraging and refreshing. Last Thursday I was outside one of the polling stations, now I've had enough, thank you, uh, when the school bus left in the afternoon. The passengers were obviously excited to see the uh, activity around the polling station. Some put their thumbs up when they saw me, others put other fingers up, but uh, uh, I think it was probably meant in a cheerful sort of a way. And some who were on their, voting on their way home from school didn't quite get the nature of a secret ballot and equally, eagerly shouted out their voting intentions as they entered the, the polling place. Can I finally turn to the central issue of further powers for the Scottish Parliament? There has been an, uh, an attempt to portray UT, UK politicians as having reneged on this. Well, well, Ed Miliband, for one, has made it quite clear he is not going to do so. However, I think that David Cameron's attempt last weekend to make further devolution dependent on a timetable for English devolution was ridiculous. It would be a nonsense to link this process with devolution in England. Powers for a Scottish Parliament have been discussed in various forms for several decades, and there have been no such discussions about how devolution in England could work. And that's why there should be a constitutional convention on English devolution after the next general, age, uh, general election. But progress on Scottish devolution must start now and must progress to the timetable. Finally, we must not mis make the mistake of thinking that f further powers for the Scottish Parliament is the end of the story. This Scottish Government has centralised power, resulting in parts of Scotland, including Glenfees and Galloway, feeling remote from Edinburgh. That too has to change. Devolution must also involve ceding power from Edinburgh to local authorities and enabling people to have a real influence on local decision making. That is the way to, uh, forward to a bright future for Scotland, its regions and for the UK. This, I believe, is indeed the dawn of a new era. This is an exciting new chapter in the story of devolution in the UK. And personally, I think it's a great privilege to be part of it. Okay, thanks. Now, Colin Bob Doris to be followed by Chick Brody. Presiding officer, around 6.30am on Friday morning after the referendum result became clear, I received a text from my sister and I'd like to share it with you. It said, Emily just woke up. That's my nine-year-old niece. Her first two words were, Mummy, independence. No, darling. Is it not? Was her reply. Just found out my oldest daughter, that's Beth, she's 14, joined the SNP. Paid, paid £2 for the privilege. Well done, Glasgow and Western Bartonshire. You all worked extremely hard. I have never seen the veil like this before. That's my hometown presiding officer. Even when Mum voted, she's very frail, voted in her slippers. I was very proud of her, Robert. Try and sleep, both of you. We are all very proud in this household. It made me cry. It made me cry tears of pride, though, not tears of despair. I tell that story because similar conversations will have been had right across Scotland, as 1.6 million people voted in huge numbers for a positive vision to empower the Scottish people, enhance all our futures, and win our nation's independence. There seems to be a suggestion from some in the No campaign, that such a huge groundswell of aspiration and hope for the Scottish people will simply melt away. It won't. It has not. Do not underestimate the civic pride that is felt by our truly amazing grassroots campaign. Be in no doubt it will grow, strengthen and prosper. The realisation of many, including, I suspect, many who voted no, is that the natural end point shall be an independent Scotland. Let me also be clear, I accept the verdict of the people of Scotland that, as yet, they are not ready for Scottish independence. They were ready in Glasgow, presiding officer. 53.5% of them wanted to see our nation independent. 
I focused my efforts in the campaign in Maryhill and Springburn and saw wonderful volunteers do so much to make our independence dream become a reality. Libby, Ronnie, Blair, Gillian, Fiona, Peter, I could go on listing the names. I could go on and on. These people gave freely of their time, their head, their heart, their soul. And I'm extremely grateful for all who did so. Presiding officer, 57% of Maryhill and Springburn said a clear yes to Scottish independence. It was former Labour heartlands that voted yes in a big way in Maryhill and Springburn. And that's despite Labour standing outside polling stations with posters declaring Labour says no. They just didn't get the fact that this was about the people of Scotland, not politicians. Labour regularly said the referendum was, and I quote, Scotland versus Salmond. The demonising of a man and an independence movement, playing party politics and playing on fears. Such tactics has left Labour nowhere to go in Glasgow, and I suspect nowhere to go in Scotland. They should be thoroughly ashamed of those tactics. However, despite the 50% yes vote in Maryhill and Springburn, it is my democratically elected job to represent all of the electorate, including my electorate that voted no right across Glasgow region. The mandate given by the people of Scotland following a no vote and following the vow made by three desperate UK leaders to give substantial more powers is the delivery of a powerhouse parliament within the UK. One that can defend the Scottish people against the attacks the UK Government now routinely make on our most vulnerable. A Parliament that does not just have extended borrowing powers, but sees the wealth we generate here in Scotland returned directly to Scotland with full tax powers sitting in this place. Let us reinvest the wealth protecting our most vulnerable in society. Let us not send wealth we generate into the hands of a right-wing Tory Chancellor to decide what is returned. If Devomax is the mandate given, then let Scotland retain all our wealth. And if that is the decision, sign a cheque back to Westminster for defence and foreign affairs. That's one possible model. I will always fight for independence. That will let the people of Scotland decide whether the UK is really a good deal or not. Presiding officer, the people of Scotland have given the UK a mandate to deliver on such a vow, and if vows are broken, a new mandate should be sought. But it won't be the 45% across Scotland who should ask for that renewed mandate. They've made their position clear. Perhaps it will be the 25% of no voters who said their central reason for voting no was the vow of substantial more powers. However, it is my duty to make new power short of independence work as best it can for Scotland. Work for the 100,000 disabled adults at risk from DLA reforms. Work for the carers who get a raw deal with the UK benefit system. Work for the sanctioned benefits claimants who don't have a humane system. Work for the mothers that want transformational childcare. The No campaign said it would work for all of them. They have to step up to the plate and prove that it can. Finally, presiding officer, when the story of Scotland's independence movement is written, I have no idea how many pages will be in that book, but I am confident that the final page will read, Scotland is an independent nation. That will open a new chapter in Scotland's history, one that will see the flourishing of a nation and realise the vision that all of the people of Scotland have for a better future for future generations. Now, Colin Chick Brody to be followed by Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Several months ago, my good friend Mike McKenzie uh, eloquently put it to me that on the topic of the referendum, uh, that, and I quote, we are lucky, we are lucky to have front row seats in the theatre of history. And so did we all, not just those of us in this chamber, but all the many that were engaged in the theatres that were the streets, the houses, the countryside, the pubs with thousands of players and actors uh, doing so with good humour, uh, in some cases tears, but many kindnesses. On Friday morning, however, I then reminded myself of Henry Ford's quote that uh, history is more or less bunk. But Mike's position 
was much more persuasive and tenable than that of Henry Ford's. We have lived, we are living through a major period of history where nothing politically, economically and socially in Scotland will ever, ever be the same again. And it is a credit to both sides of the campaign that we have, we are and we will embrace the ultimate consequences of this period. It is not finished yet. On Friday, some of us may have been down, but definitely not downhearted. The Monday before the election, we held a meeting in the market in an air of 100 organisers and team leaders, people of various political parties, of associated organisations, and of none. A collective vibrancy in pursuit of the one overarching aim. On Friday night, we had a party, and it was a party in Air Town Hall, and that fortified them with the view that their team, their cause, uh, should continue. But I do, uh, in this speech, congratulate the no side on the outcome, temporary though it may be. Presiding officer in general, we cannot castigate the Scottish-based press and media, which presumed to a fairer degree uh, of, of impartiality, and they should be commended for that. That, of course, was not reflected by their colleagues in the London press uh, and London media. A daily wail that suggested pestilence was to be spread across the land, that monster mice and birds were invading and aliens had landed, added nothing to the constructive debate shared by both sides of this campaign on the ground. Presiding officer, we will each have an event to write in our own personal history books. Mine was receiving a ticket to attend a Gordon Brown speech to the Labour, not the better together, the Labour faithful at Rugby Park in Kilmarnock. I was told it was to start at 11 o'clock. Now, I wouldn't say I'm suspicious, uh, and I wouldn't dare to comment on the event's competencies, organisers' competencies, but I did check elsewhere and found that it was to start at 10.15. So I got there from here with, the, with minutes to spare. I was stopped at the door while stewards went off to make, as they said, a phone call. Unwittingly, while that was happening, I was shown in to the meeting by a young, unknowing steward. And you can imagine my total despair at the end of the meeting with questions ready that the chairperson then said there were to be no questions. Uh, I wonder why. Democracy at work. And Lewis, Lewis MacDonald is no longer here. I'll share with him some of the details that were not recorded in, in the press of that meeting. Now, I don't diminish the role that the former Prime Minister played in the result. What is unforgivable in my book, however, were the roles played by those less directly uh, and affected involved by others. And let me give you just two examples. Sir Martin Sorrell of WPP, of which TNS, TNS, the polling company, is an arm, warning us about uncertainty and independence. With the uncertain future of a quarter of a million children living in poverty in Scotland, we should not have received lectures from someone who's sitting on a £30 million annual income. And secondly, Bob Dudley, the chief executive of BP, who predicted uncertainty around oil incomes and, long and longevity. This was just after workers on the monster uh, Clare Ridgefield had been, paid, had been given full salary to the end of September and told not to come back until the end, the end of September. And, and at the same time, having just placed an order for £150 million for oil drilling equipment uh, in Korea. All of that, of course, coincident with a secret visit by the Prime Minister. No journalists, no cameras, and a visit that Alistair Campbell apparently said to a local Shetland journalist was the best kept secret west of Shetland. Well, it isn't now, Alistair. Presiding officer, the integrity of the campaign on the ground in Scotland, applied by both sides, was commendable. What was not a com a commendable, commendable were the noises off stage right, like those I've just mentioned, those outriders for the Westminster government. So, Presiding Officer, we now move forward to write another page in the history books. I believe that those in the Scottish body politic will address the proposed new powers if they are so determined. Uh, of course, not with, without some partiality, but with that integrity that I mentioned before. I trust the same will be applied by the UK Government, but I doubt it. On their allegation, not ours, that oil, for example, is declining, that they borrowed £120 billion in 2012, it would have been £131.5 billion, without the oil, and a debt, a debt of £1.57 trillion pounds 
uh, by 2070. It had a duty in this campaign to extend, to, to explain to the pensioners, the carers, the health workers, those on benefits and others, how that debt it will be paid by a UK government. They manifestly failed. Presiding officer, lastly, despite these concerns, we accept the verdict, uh, but also accept that while we cannot rewrite history, we recognise the continued need to meet the aspirations, uh, particularly of As the you young. Close. I'm just closing now. Many of whom were at that party last Friday. And as we write the, the future, we have to ensure, we will ensure, that a vow is a promise well kept. Else, else the UK government shall reap what it sows. Uh, thank you. And now Colin Hugh Henry to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I welcome the contribution made at the beginning of this debate by John Swinney. I think he struck the right tone. He made it very clear what his view and the view of the Scottish Government is. In actual fact, it was in stark contrast with some of the contributions that have been made from his backbenches since, because I felt as though I'm sitting in a therapy session for a support group <laughs> for people um, who are clearly suffering. And some of that I understand. No, no, I actually don't mean that to be flippant, because some of it I, I do understand. I've known Sandra White for many years going back to Renfrew District Council days. And I know just how passionate Sandra White is about independence. It's something that has driven her all her life. So I can well understand why people who lost out on the referendum last week are feeling anger, they're feeling bitter, they're, they're, frustration, they're feeling frustrated, they are, they are disappointed. And that, I think, is only natural. And sometimes I think those of us who are on the other side of that debate just need to accept that it will take some time for some of that to, to work through. I do, however, think that it doesn't excuse the comments, for example, that were made by uh, Christian Allard when he, he made the threat to opposition politicians that you better not be seen in the streets of North East Scotland, because I don't think that contributions like that have got any place, certainly, Mr Allard. No. Mr Allard. But, thank you, President Officer. Thanks very much for the member. Uh, I would like to precise what I was saying. I was saying that it was absolutely not a threat. I was saying that the leaders of the opposition were not seen in the street of Aberdeen. That's it. I didn't say that they were not welcome in the street of Aberdeen. Certainly not. You you well, that wasn't what I heard in the earlier contribution. I and mean, we could go back and check the official record to see exactly uh, what that said. And, and I suppose it's maybe part of that anger therapy, you know, to, to listen to Bob Doris where he says in one sentence, there shall be an independent Scotland. And then in the very next sentence he says, I accept the verdict. Well, presiding officer, the verdict of the silent majority last week was overwhelmingly that Scotland did not want to leave the United Kingdom, that Scotland clearly said no to separation. And by all means, you know, get it out of your system and you know, express all your frustration and your feelings in here. But you also, no thank you, but also we need to recognise that we now have an endorsement which has never previously been made and that is a positive endorsement, a historic endorsement, that Scotland wants to be part of the United Kingdom. And I do think that the view of that silent majority needs to be accepted. And we now need to move on. You know, Alex Salmond, speaking previously on behalf of the Scottish Government, said that this was a once-in-a-lifetime referendum. And no one from the Scottish Government or the SNP contradicted him. So let's just accept that, yes, if there had been a one-vote majority for independence, we would have had to have accepted that vote. But now that there's been a decisive almost 400,000 majority the other way, we, no thank you, we need to accept that and move on. And can we not now move on to what actually happened in that historic referendum with that huge vote 
across Scotland that, yes, people were voting to stay within the United Kingdom, but I think in many respects people were also, as many speakers have said, were voting for change. People did not want to see a continuation of what was happening just now. And many people, some people may well have voted for additional powers, but frankly, the majority of people that I spoke to who said they were voting yes, including Labour voters, said that they were voting against austerity, they were voting for better public services, they were voting for a better future. They thought that there was something on offer from the yes side. Now, clearly the majority did not accept the economic arguments and the social arguments that were being made by the yes side. But if we accept for a minute that there is a mood to change, then we should be willing to reach out across the parties and work together to make that change happen. We should accept, for example, that on health, let's get all the rhetoric about privatisation and so on put aside. There is no party in this parliament that wants to privatise the health service. So can we all now not work together to look at the problems that are confronting us in the health service in Scotland? Can we not put all our collective wit and minds together to come up with solutions? Can we not say that young people in this country want the chance of a college education? And let's look at what we can do to make that possible. Can we not say that, yes, our local government services are under threat and there are financial pressures facing the Scottish Government, the UK Government, and indeed governments across the world? So can we not work together to come up with solutions that protect the vulnerable people in my constituency in Renfrewshire South whose services have been squeezed because of the lack of money going to them? So can we not now say the people have spoken, let's move on? And let's work together to make a reality of the aspiration for a better country. Thank you very much. And finally, Colin Beatty, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Presiding officer, I would firstly like to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the First Minister. The Scottish National Party has made incredible strides under the 20 years of his leadership. And we've gone from being a party with little elected representation to winning two Scottish elections in a row, the second of which gave us, of course, the mandate for an independence referendum. And that's in no way due to chance or luck. The First Minister's leadership, his effective partnership with the Deputy First Minister and the policies put forward to make Scotland a more equitable society, even in the light of Westminster's austerity programmes, all these things clearly struck a powerful chord with the Scottish electorate. That we were unable to achieve independence this time round speaks not of any failings, but more of the desperate and, frankly, sometimes unsavoury tactics of Westminster, who had foolishly assumed a no vote was in the bag. Now, I've been a proud member of this party for many, many years, perhaps even as long as Stuart Stevenson, and I've seen capable leaders come and go. And it's truly my belief that the First Minister has led the party to its greatest achievements to date. We only have to look at how our membership has risen dramatically since the polls closed last Thursday. And we see how people are attracted to our ideals. Our overall membership is now over 58,000, an increase of 33,000 in the past few days. We're now the third biggest party in the UK. And I gladly welcome all new members, especially in my role as party treasurer. And I'm keenly looking forward to both next year's general election and the Scottish election in 2016. One thing we do know from the referendum is that politics in Scotland has changed for the better. I think we can all be proud of the fact that the Scottish people have never been as engaged in a political event as they were in leading up to last Thursday's polls. A truly incredible 97% of the electorate registered to vote, while turnout reached almost 85%. And to put that in perspective, turnouts at the 1979 and 1997 referendums were 63 and 60% respectively. Clearly, the vast majority of people in Scotland were energised and involved in this debate. When voters were asked if they felt that deciding Scotland's future was something they could be proud of, 82% said yes, and once that's once don't knows were excluded. Conversations over the referendum sprang up everywhere, from trains and buses to pubs and clubs to golf courses and football matches. And Scotland can take pride in being able to hold a largely mature and sensible debate among its citizens. And I believe we provided a democratic model for the world to follow. 
Once we look at the statistics, the Yes campaign's use of social media was not only innovative, but also a key factor in reaching new demographics. While all, all the, almost all the traditional forms of media advocated a no vote, the Yes campaign successfully utilised Facebook with over 322,000 page likes compared to 219,000 for Better Together, and Twitter with 100,000 followers compared to Better Together's 40,000. And I think we harnessed the social media skills to engage with the wider electorate. And this methodology is clear in that we were able to bypass editorial bias and Westminster pressure to get our message across plainly and simply. Allowing young people to take part in the referendum is a step that should now be extended to all elections. And I met with many 16 and 17 year olds speaking to groups of up to 100, 150. And it was hugely satisfying to discuss independence and other issues with them. Some of them had told me they'd originally planned to vote no, sometimes influenced by what their parents were planning to do. But the more they read and talked about it, the more they came to the conclusion that independence offered them a brighter future. It was clear to me that these teenagers were some of the most well-read of my constituents with regard to the independence debate. So where do we go from here? And as part of the referendum process, we know that the Westminster parties have offered the people of Scotland new powers and apparently agreed to a timetable under which these would be delivered. 25% of no voters voted no because of this promise, resulting in a clear majority of voters who wanted some form of change for Scotland. The leaders of the Westminster parties were so desperate to win that they even declared their commitment to more powers on the front page of the Daily Record. Yet, not, after, not hours after the result had been declared, this pledge was apparently falling apart. The first to break ranks was David Cameron in effectively linking further devolution, Scottish devolution to solving the West Lothian question. And Cameron has effectively admitted that his signature on the pledge is worthless. No doubt Cameron was pressured by the actions and statements of his own backbenchers, and I'm sure these quotes will live long in the memory of our electorate, who voted for more powers in the Scottish Parliament. There would be a bloodbath, we were told. We should recognise there's no guarantee that the pledge would be implemented in the United Kingdom Parliament said Christopher Chope, Tory MP for Christchurch. Nadine Doris, the Tory's own ver very own celebrity MP, spelt out her own thoughts when she mocked Scotland being subsidised in order to eat deep-fried Mars bars. And I do hope that uh, Ms Doris doesn't speak for her whole party. No sooner had Michael Gove jumped on the bandwagon than Ed Miliband was forced to jump off. Agreeing with David Cameron on more powers to the Scottish people was one thing, but putting that on a platform with English votes for English people was a step too far. And one wonders why this hadn't been thought of prior to the referendum vote. Let's not forget that, as well, that no less a leading light than Gordon Brown has promised us that these plans will come to fruition, according to the clear timetable he set out. And I'm sure the keen-eared among you will have noted that, despite Mr Brown being largely credited with saving the No campaign, his name was curiously absent last Monday when Ed Miliband thanked those Labour Party members who helped win the referendum. Make, that, make of that what you will, but it doesn't fill me with confidence that the devolution timetable has been taken all that seriously. We will be watching every step Westminster takes. We may have lost this battle, but I am absolutely confident we will win the war and achieve independence for this nation. Thank you very much. And before we move to closing speeches, I would just remind all members who have taken part in this debate yesterday and today unless they have let the presiding officers know that they won't be here for good reason, that they should now be present for the closing speeches. We now call Alison Johnston. Scotland has voted no, and I respect the democratic outcome of the vote. But in fact, Scotland did so much more than vote. Scotland became a participative democracy, and the change was almost palpable. And we must strive to maintain this level of participation. The vote didn't deliver the result that the majority, but not all Greens, campaigned for and supported, but it has delivered change. We may not have the opportunity to develop a written constitution, but constitution is a word that we use to refer to our physical state as regards vitality, health and strength. And in this regard, I feel encouraged and optimistic. Alex Salmond was right yesterday when he said, that a new spirit is abroad in this land and that we are a better nation today. And I agree because people who have never attended a political meeting in their lives came along and took part in the debate. 
People who wouldn't have come along to traditional hustings where politicians debate their manifestos came along with their questions, their comments and indeed their own manifestos. And there are those who feel that other issues were sidelined as we discussed the Constitution, but that's not a view I share. And it's not the experience of the thousands of people who debated Scotland's futures in the meetings I attended, in church halls, in school halls, and even in the stage of Dunfermline's Alhambra Theatre. A narrow debate would never have energised Scotland in the way this campaign has. The debate was broadened, deepened, energised and given a life of its own by the many diverse groups, organisations and individuals who took part. A woman attending a discussion with an all-woman panel at Edinburgh Art College stood up and said, I can't believe I'm standing up, speaking in public, taking part in a meeting about the way my country is governed. So many people found their feet, their voices in this campaign. Women for Independence, the Radical Independence Convention, Commonweal, the National Collective, Business for Scotland, many more groups made sure that people from all walks of life were involved and represented in this campaign. And we can learn so much from these groups about engagement. Social media was invaluable in this campaign. It helped level what was a very unlevel playing field in terms of support from corporate print media. The nature of campaigning itself was transformed in this campaign. I took part in debates with people from all the organisations I mentioned and from none, and I was unfailingly impressed. I took part in debates with and attended by our youngest voters, and they demonstrated why they should be fully involved in the democratic process, and I welcome the growing consensus for votes at 16. A meeting in Falkirk, organised by National Collective, will be long remembered by all who were there. Young actors took part, speakers, poets, prominent playwright Alan Bissett. I was staggered by their talent. It was a Friday night, and even when there was an interval, nobody left. The meeting carried on way past schedule. Six sort of traditional political speakers interspersed by outstanding Scottish artists, a model for the new politics in the new Scotland. A woman with disabilities was at this meeting. She relies on benefits for her income, and she told the meeting that she felt she was voiceless and that this campaign was finally giving her the means to get her message across to those politicians whose policies were making her life ever more challenging. And this insistent, growing, confident voice led to the announcement of The Vow by David Cameron, Nick Clegg and Ed Miliband when they realised, when they recognised that the status quo is simply unacceptable. And as tight as the timescales are that Lord Smith has been given to work to, we must do all that we can to ensure that those who contributed so much to the debate are given every opportunity to contribute to this process too. Debate in Scotland has flourished not in spite of, but because of the diversity of speakers in both the Yes and the No campaign. It's no secret that the Greens and the SNP have many policy differences, as do the Better Together parties. But we do have common ground, all of us, and we must all work together for the best outcome now. Ken McIntosh suggested yesterday that amongst those who had lost the vote, there might be a temptation to lash out in anger. Not at all. He said that people were genuinely scared, and Murdo Fraser said that even the debate was a threat to their identity. Well, my experience was a far more positive one. People questioning assertions, yet relishing involvement. And I hope that this debate has demonstrated to all that we can disagree with one another and remain friends. And we in this chamber have a duty to continue to demonstrate that. Yeah. Presiding officer, I don't accept the narrative of a hostile and bitter campaign that's been put forward by some. And I do believe we should focus on the overwhelmingly, outstandingly positive level of engagement, the level of participation, participation in the vote. This campaign was carried on in a passionate yet respectful manner. It was intense, but by and large, it was tolerant, engaging, and at times even entertaining. The narrative is a positive one. So what now? The vow must be made real, and we must deliver for all. All of Scotland's people, all who voted, and all who did not. Presiding officer, Greens weren't campaigning for a wee version of Westminster. Let's engage with the COSLA paper on democracy on my own party's review. The debate has shown us that democracy begins at street level. 
But in this, in this energy and resource rich country, fuel poverty persists, food banks proliferate, equal pay feels far, far away. And regardless who takes on the Westminster reins in May, we have more austerity promised beyond anything yet experienced. But those who got off their settees, as presiding officer said yesterday, aren't going back to them. Politics in Scotland must be open to all who wish a fairer and more equal nation. We should be ambitious in our vision for what we can do and willing to work together to make it happen. Because if we do that, another better Scotland is possible. Thank you, Ms Johnson. Before I call Alice McInnes, can I just point out to members that this is a continuation of the debate that started yesterday. It would not be unreasonable for those people who took part in the debate yesterday to have been in, the cha in this uh, chamber for the closing speeches. I have a note of their names, and can I say I am not pleased. Alice McInnes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It has been a long and interesting debate, a necessary debate, I think. And we all agree that there are a number of remarkable things about the referendum. Firstly, the turnout. At 85%, it's a victory for democracy. There's no doubt that there was an appetite to be involved, that people realised that their vote counted. Voter apathy? I don't think so. On the 18th of September 2014, indifference was conquered. Secondly, votes for 16 and 17-year-olds. Well, like everyone else, I was delighted at how these new young voters got involved. Liberal Democrats have long supported votes at 16, and it's great that there is now cross-party agreement to look at extending the franchise to 16 and 17-year-olds for all elections. Our decision to extend the franchise for this most important of decisions here in Scotland might now act as a catalyst for change across the UK. And thirdly, engagement in the political process. This was no dry constitutional debate. It enlivened people around the country. Debates and discussions took place in village halls, student unions, church groups, youth groups, and in living rooms and around kitchen tables. Books were written, plays and poems penned, and acres of newsprint comment and analysis was created. The BBC, pilloried and picketed by the nationalists, actually provided an immense amount of coverage on all its platforms, radio, TV, and online. It gave direct voice to citizens through countless debates and phone-ins. And I would particularly praise the way it gave voice to young people in Radio 1's big conversation with Edith Bowman and the big, big debate at the Hydro. And people around Scotland agreed that we could and should have a better future, that we all wanted a fairer Scotland. What we disagreed on was whether we actually needed to leave the United Kingdom and set up a completely new state to do that. However, what we must all now agree on is that the vote was fair and robust and settles the question, and that everyone's vote counted equally. You know, many insults have been thrown over the last few months. Many of them can be dismissed as the actions of hotheads. But when the First Minister says there's no such thing as a no vote, only a deferred yes, that no voters were tricked and duped, that older no voters should look in the mirror and justify their vote to the younger generation, that what is now established as a settled will of the Scottish people can somehow be overturned. Those are insults of a different order to Scots around this country. <laughs> Alex, Salmon. Alex Salmon might have announced his standing down, but he's still the First Minister of this country and he should be speaking on behalf of all Scots and abiding by the Edinburgh Agreement. Section 30, which he says was included at his own insistence, states that the outcome will be respected. Was he so cocksure that a yes would win that he thought that this was a one-way obligation? So let's hear it loud and clear from him and his nationalists. The sovereign will of the Scottish people is that we remain part of the UK. His role now, and that of his successor, is to work on that vision of a stronger Scottish Parliament within the United Kingdom. There should be no more stoking of the fires of division. One of the things I think that was palpable on polling day was the sense of purpose as people poured into the polling stations to cast their votes. There was a quiet determination amongst many of the voters, and that was evidenced by the result. I have talked to thousands of voters over many months, face to face, on the doorstep, more importantly, I listened, and the shy no's were there all along. 
If you took time to listen on the doorstep, the message was there. And yet in the fervour of their cause, you know, the yes voters made a lot of noise, they talked a lot, they parted a lot, but the mistake was that they forgot to listen. They drowned out the quieter voices, sometimes carelessly, just not understanding that many people preferred not to broadcast their views, but that nevertheless they had thoughtful and strongly held views of their own. But you know, sometimes it was deliberate when Better Together street stalls were visited by crowds of Yes campaigners, when Jim Murphy's street corner talks were disrupted, when on the eve of poll in Inverurie in Aberdeenshire, nine Better Together helpers, not political activists, but helpers, were surrounded by hordes of chanting Yes campaigners in the most intimidating way for half an hour. And it worries me that this is still happening. Many of those who voted yes are asserting that theirs was somehow the, the right vote, and either they were robbed... The member's no not taking an intervention. ..or that somehow the no votes counted for less. And the danger is that the binary choice in the ballot created that polarisation. But we need to remember that everyone who voted cared about Scotland. And we must now all work together to bring about the better Scotland that everyone who voted agreed was worth striving for. And that's why I was so pleased to hear Nicola Sturgeon say this morning that she would work with others and seek common cause on the issues that unite us. We all agree that we need to sustain the energy and interest and political discourse. There's much we can do to renew our democracy here in Scotland. And it's not all about what Westminster devolves to us, but about how we here in this Parliament share our power. Alex Rowley was right yesterday to argue for stronger local government. You know, Scotland is one of the most centralised countries in Europe. We now have a unique opportunity to re-examine the relationship between local and national government in Scotland and to put it on a formally codified footing. COSLA's Local Matters Report and our Home Rule for Scotland both offer routes towards need to end up. So let me end by returning to what the presiding officer said yesterday. It's now for us to embrace and nurture the desire for political expression. It cannot and must not be business as usual. In responding to that, I would acknowledge we don't have all the answers. Politics is too important to be left to the politicians. We could do worse than look at the Electoral Reform Society's Democracy Max, a 13-month-long citizen-led inquiry into the vision for a good Scottish democracy. Friends, let's keep listening. Let's work together. Let's make Scotland better. Thank you. I now call Jackson Carlow. Mr Carlow, eight minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Alison McInnes for her speech in the end of a very long debate? Can I single out one contribution in particular, and that is the one we heard just before five o'clock yesterday afternoon from the First Minister himself. Here was a First Minister at play with the Parliament. I think a First Minister thoroughly enjoying himself in the summation speech that he gave at that moment. Uh, it was a masterclass in summation speeches and that he smiled warmly to everyone who had made a contribution in the debate and then embraced those who disagreed with him with a stiletto. I think he had enjoyed his afternoon immensely. And who can begrudge him that? Because it did come at the end of what had been a torrid and turgid and dramatic week for him. And let us just, because I don't think this was always clear from many of the contributions I heard during the course of this debate, um, it was in fact an emphatic defeat for those who had sought to seek the independence of Scotland from the United Kingdom. It was emphatic in the sense that when the Labour Party beat the Conservative Party in 1945 in what was called a landslide, they did so by eight points. In modern political terms, the great height campaign of President Obama, when he won in what was described as a landslide, was secured with a majority of six points. This was a majority of 10 points. If it had been a presidential election, 28 of the 32 states voted to stay with the United Kingdom. And the 85% of, of Scotland who spoke now stand at odds with the 50% who voted for this parliament. But as Neil Finlay said yesterday, the sovereign will, the term so often expressed by the party of government, the sovereign will of the people of Scotland has spoken, and it is that Scotland will remain within the United Kingdom. Now, yes, I too welcome the contribution of 16 and 17 year olds. I have to say it was a contribution remarkably free of cynicism. 
So I do say to those people who now seek to say, well, we'll pay lip service to the result, but we'll then set it aside and seek to ignore it and carry on as if it wasn't the result that we actually achieved, that you must not betray the young people who contributed to this debate with a cynical response to the voice of that democracy. I also want to pay tribute to MSPs all across the chamber. I thought the contributions of Kezia Dugdale, of Nicola Sturgeon, of Patrick Harvey and of Ruth Davidson all demonstrated how this parliament contributed positively, enthusiastically and well to the debate that took place. But it was Patrick Harvey who I think said that the concerns some had had that we would find ourselves split asunder uh, did not come about. Can I, can I tell one short story uh, against myself at the risk of doing so? Um, and that is to say that Patrick talked about the families and friends and neighbours who, who found themselves divided. Such was my own family. I have to say, uh, one of my sons was persuaded by the arguments of the party sitting there. <laughs> And can I tell you what he did? I voted by post. He voted by post too. He mixed our two ballots together so that when I was photographed posting my ballot, I actually have no idea what it was that I actually posted at that point. But it was because we didn't have a result, as the First Minister said, that was determined by one vote. Because I think had it been determined by one vote either side, there would have been recrimination across Scotland by people who said only if you had. It was the decisive nature of the result, which actually, I think, allows all those who were on different sides of the argument to come together. Now, there has been some discussion over the powers. I want to rest with the epitome of positivity that Mr. Swinney claimed himself to be this afternoon. I think it's important that the Scottish National Party, the government, participate in this debate. And I have to say that I hope that we do arrive at a conclusion which is the sum of, and not the division of, the ambitions of the party's, the party's policies that were put in terms of the new powers that come forward. Now, in the immediate period ahead, two areas that I don't think have been touched upon have been leadership and the challenge for this parliament itself. Now, on leadership, I hope there is a contest within the Scottish National Party for the leadership of Scotland. Do you know, it was a, it was a democratic affront, apparently, when Gordon Brown succeeded Tony Blair in office, according to that party. It was a democratic affront when John Major succeeded Margaret Thatcher. But in one important respect, the SNP is to join the establishment and that they now believe that they, Nicola Sturgeon should succeed as First Minister without there being any input from the public. And I think it's even slightly more embarrassing than that. Because if we look at the ballot paper that people completed in 2011, it says Scottish National Party, Alex Salmon for First Minister. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of Scots elected the government on the basis that it would be Alex Salmon who would be the First Minister. There is the democratic deficit writ large for all to see. Now, Edwin Morgan, when this parliament was founded, said, no, no, thank you, Mr. McKelvey. I know you have ruled yourself out from the speech that you gave yesterday afternoon. It was, um, it, it was Edwin Morgan who said, a nest of fearties we do not want. So I do hope that if there's not to be a contest for the position of First Minister, there will be for the Deputy Leader. And I say it because contests provoke ideas. And the difficulty we have just now is that I don't think we're altogether clear what the SNP believes the next 18 months of this Parliament will be used to do. For the last three years, we have been told that the only solution to anything is independence. The solution of independence is now off the agenda. And when Gavin Brown challenged uh, John Swinney as to when we might have a debate in the government programme, Joe Fitzpatrick shook his head as if this was completely unreasonable. <laughs> I do hope we're not going to be expected to wait until the outcome of the SNP leadership election in November before this parliament is told what the actual business of the next 18 months is going to be. We need to know what the SNP's ambition for Scotland is on the issues that now need the attention that has been denied them for the next 18 months. And I see Mr Fitzpatrick wants to tell me when we'll have that debate. Mr Fitzpatrick. Mr Swinney will, will confirm the information you seek any closing. Just Forward to that. But I do hope we get a proper contest from the SNP in relation to the deputy leadership. I want to see Chick for Chief. I want to see Joan for Justice. I want to see Sandra for Glasgow UDI campaigns up there and about. <laughs> Yesterday I saw Mr Mackay and Mr Yusuf having a granita-type conversation in the Scottish Parliament canteen. I hope that they all stand forward and give us the opportunity to have a proper contest. 
Presiding officer, the final challenge I think is one for you that you alluded to at the start of our proceedings yesterday. In 2016, this parliament will be quite different. The MSPs who are elected need to understand what the contract of employment will be. The business that we will have to conduct will be quite different. Hugh Henry, myself, Jack McConnell and others in the last parliament queried the way in which we are established. It may well be that we will require to sit more days of the week. It may well be that this parliament will need to ensure that the MSPs who are here in the next are properly resourced. It may need to be that we see MPs who have previously seen their career at Westminster as being here. I'd like to see Labour MPs come. I'd like to see Liberal Democrat MPs come. A bit harder for us. And in the case of... <laughs> And in the case of the SNP, certainly a lot less productive. But, ladies, <laughs> but, presiding officer, the people of Scotland are now looking at the referendum result in the rear view mirror. The view now through the windscreen is forward. It is to the business of the next 18 months. It is to the establishment and delivery of the additional settled powers to this parliament. And it's to ensuring that this parliament, which meets after 2016 when those powers start to arrive, is capable of giving proper scrutiny and leadership to the people of Scotland. I now call Ian Gray, Mr Gray, 12 minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Many members <clears throat> have spoken uh, over the past two days of the privilege of participating in the referendum campaign. And for me, uh, there was the added dimension of fighting that campaign in my own constituency of East Lothian. For not only is East Lothian the birthplace of the saltire by a legend, a gift from God to King Angus of the Picts, but it is also the birthplace of the very idea of a union between Scotland and England. John Mayer, philosopher, rationalist, born in Tantallon and educated in Haddington, was the very first to suggest 500 years ago that collaboration in a negotiated union rather than destructive competition, in those days often on the battlefield, was a better future for Scotland. Now, it was an idea which waited 200 years for its time to come, and as the First Minister himself pointed out yesterday, waited 300 more for democratic endorsement, which it now has, and re resoundingly so. But of course, that endorsement was not for the union envisaged by Mayor, but rather for the vision elaborated last century by an adopted son of East Lothian, John P. McIntosh, who argued the case for a powerful Scottish Parliament in a strong and modern United Kingdom. And we stand now in the very embodiment of that. Mackintosh's words etched into the very stone of our Parliament on the threshold of the Donner, Donald Dewar Room. And devolution etched into our very body politic by not one but now two referenda. So I am proud that last Thursday East Lothian said no to independence and yes to a devolved Scotland, part of the United Kingdom, and that Scotland itself followed suit. Now many have praised the electorate and celebrated the fact that an unprecedented 85% of them turned out to vote, and rightly so. But it is not enough to praise the electorate or celebrate their numbers. We must respect their decision or we treat them with contempt. It is quite wrong to suggest, as the First Minister did at the weekend and Joe McAlpine did again today, that no voters were tricked by promises on new powers. I could as easily argue that yes voters were gulled by wildly exaggerated promises of oil revenues or dishonest threats to the NHS. And as, and as for promises unravelling, I could ask what happened to the promise that the referendum would settle the independence question for a lifetime? How many hours did that promise last? The truth is that any politician who tries to tell voters they were fooled is not but the fool themselves. Briefly. I mean, I mean, I take the point the member is making. Would you accept that uh, the day after a Conservative Lib Dem victory at Westminster, he and his party would accept that and respect that, but would immediately start working for another victory? The member, the member cannot seriously be equating 
a fundamental constitutional question like this with the normal run of elections. And look, anyone who fought this campaign knows that however people voted, they had thought long and hard. There was no monopoly of logic, scepticism, altruism, enthusiasm, pride, passion, or above all, patriotism on either side of the ballot paper, nor of hope or fear. And let me make a general point about hope, because many speakers have talked about it. Hope is a precious commodity, and politics should always nurture hope. But the peddling of false hope is the prerogative of the snake oil salesman down the centuries, and we should call it out whenever it is offered. As Lewis MacDonald made clear in his contribution, democracy denies us the luxury of claiming people were voting for or against this or that. It demands we accept the verdict they delivered on the question we put before them. So we on the no side must acknowledge that a substantial number of people voted yes. And the yes side must accept that the outcome was decisive, a majority of over 10%. Almost 25% more people saying no to independence than said yes. But above all, we must all respect the decision. You know, someone once wrote, when you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. It has been an energetic and inspirational campaign. And many members have provided stories of that. Most memorably, perhaps, Georgie Boy Adams and perhaps most eloquently, Alison Johnson towards the end there. But we have also heard stories of its divisiveness, not least from Alison McInnes in closing. And of another nation, Lincoln said, a house divided cannot stand against itself. A historic decision has been taken, but real choices remain. We can, on this side, Ignore the message of that substantial yes vote, but that would be foolish. A no vote was still a vote for a changed Scotland. We must deliver and we will on the promises made. And on the government side, they can choose to lead Scotland into the endless revisitation of the people's decision and condemn this nation to continuing uncertainty. That would be irresponsible. Or we can unite behind the outcome disagreeing where we must, but on the fundamental question of independence, healing the divisions, because we can. And that is surely our obligation now. Let us seek then not distinction between how young and old voted, or men and women, or city and rural Scotland. Let us not look for ambiguity in a result which is clear. Instead, let us look for common ground that voters yes and no want Scotland to prosper and to be fairer, take our economic prospects. Last week, Alex Salmon talked of the Scotland of Adam Smith. But Adam Smith said the union was a measure from which infinite good has been derived to this country. That is the authentic discourse of the Enlightenment echoing down to us. But you can find it right here, too, in the white paper. Look at the economic platform. It says we must have stable currency union, Bank of England as lender of last resort, membership of the EU, a single energy market, single financial services regulatory system, UK-wide research funding, access to MOD contracts, and, of course, free movement of people, goods, and services across the UK. These are the real job-creating powers we have now secure. And having rediscovered that, our job is to rededicate ourselves to using them to the maximum benefit of Scotland, its businesses and its people. To win even more investment in a renewable industry. To help our universities attract yet more funding for research ever more imaginative, innovative and brilliant. And then let us turn to the thirst for social justice this campaign revealed on all sides. How profoundly have we had to revisit those principles of pooling and sharing resources 
and how we distribute not just wealth and opportunity, but power too. The people have decided that we do that, but that we do it in the framework of a united kingdom, but with devolution strengthened. So let us dedicate ourselves, not to questioning that, but making it work. One example, the announcement yesterday that Labour will tax properties worth £2 million and use the proceeds for the NHS. Now, in truth, there may not be many such properties, relatively speaking, in Scotland. But it is exactly the pooling and sharing of resources across the UK, which means that we can tax the mansions of Belgravia and redistribute some of the proceeds to employ GPs and health visitors in Easter House and Muir, Muir House and Whitfield, if we only have the will to do that. And finally, the common ground of the franchise. And I have to agree with so many speakers that the exercise of their votes by 16 and 17 year olds was exemplary. And I simply add my voice to those from all sides who say they should have the vote now in all elections. So if we choose to look forward from this referendum decision, not always back to it, if we choose to stand on the common ground it has cleared for us, and if we do so with open minds, then we can see we are at the foothills of great progress now. Presiding officer, it is no secret that I once aspired to be First Minister, nor that it was the people's will that this is not my destiny. Damn them. <laughs> but if Miss Sturgeon does, as seems likely, succeed to that privileged office, she will have earned it by her hard work. But it will be hers only by that very expression of the people's will three years ago, which I interpret rather more generously than Mr. Carlaw did. Yet, she will also inherit the solemn mandate of last Thursday that the people of Scotland charge her with taking this nation forward in the enduring historic partnership of the United Kingdom, four nations but one family. And she can choose to accept that mandate and seek to unite us. Or she can choose to dispute it and she will certainly divide us. But she cannot do both. You cannot, you cannot speak truly of unity in the language of division. You cannot heal with words crafted to wound. You cannot have Mr Swinney at 240 describing the referendum as a model of democracy and Sandra White at 3pm saying it wasn't fair. You cannot... You cannot... You cannot declaim one Scotland on Friday morning and declare permanent revolution on Sunday as the First Minister did. Well, we'll hear what Ms Sturgeon has to say in the days ahead. But as politicians, we should remember every day, vox populi, vox dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Scotland's people spoke last Thursday. They spoke in plain English, in Lallans, in Doric, in Norn, and even in what my leader calls the tongue of God, the Gaelic. And they said, we are better, we are bigger, and we are always stronger together. Thank you. Can I now ask John Swinney to wind up the debate? <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, you have till five o'clock. Presiding Officer, the, the debate this afternoon has been a fascinating tour around the referendum campaign from all perspectives and we've had some intriguing insights into how people occupied the last four weeks of their lives. Um, I'm glad 
I don't often say this, but I'm glad I wasn't in Paisley during the uh, <laughs> referendum campaign, because I wouldn't have had to be an observer on what on earth George Adam was getting up to. And uh, we've heard uh, accounts from around the country of all that has been going on. Perhaps the, the greatest test of our imagination was the one uh, given to us by Jackson Carlow of uh, a Granita-type conversation in the Scottish Parliament canteen. I'm still, I'm still wrestling with that concept in my mind as to how Jackson Carlow could inadvertently have conflated the Granita restaurant with the Scottish Parliamentary <laughs> canteen. I can think of... The, well, the similarity, I suppose, is food, but there I suspect the similarity ends in the... Uh, unless he's going to a different part of the canteen than what I'm going to. But uh, uh, nonetheless, it was an interesting point of the imagination. Let me uh, re reflect on one of the points which has run through this debate upon which everybody has been agreed. And Alison McInnes made the point very forcefully, Ian Gray has just made it likewise, and others on all sides of the uh, chamber have made this point. And that's been about the contribution of 16 and 17 year old voters to the electoral process. And everyone says it was, well not everybody said it was a good idea. I seem to remember there was division in the Parliament about whether that should happen, if my memory says me right. But we got to a point of agreement, it happened, it was legislated for, and everybody in this chamber now believes that it's the right thing to do. And we can't do anything about it. We don't have the legislative power in this Parliament to affect what every single one of us agrees is the right thing to do. And I don't say that to put division out there. I just say it as one of these indelible facts that Ian Gray was just going on about and that Jackson Carlow were just going on about. It's a fact. We're all, every one of us, totally in vigorous agreement about the 16 and 17 year olds having the right to vote in all elections and we cannot put that into practice. I most definitely will, yes. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful. I agree with him that we should, of course, have the, the ability to resolve that issue amongst other electoral issues for this parliament here in this parliament. <laughs> but if we do, or if this is done in some other place and votes at 16 becomes the norm, voter education for young people, particularly in a school context, is going to have to be achieved. And the consistency that we sought during the referendum that wasn't achieved everywhere is going to have to be achieved as well. Does he agree with me that voter education is something we could crack on with right now while we continue to make the case for votes at 16, whether decided here or elsewhere? But, yes, I'm, I'm all for uh, effective, uh, dispassionate voter education. And I think, actually... Uh, you know, one of the things that I have to say irritated me during the election camp, the referendum campaign was people saying I don't have enough information. I could hardly get in my front door for information <laughs> sitting at the back of the front door on a daily basis. So I think, you know, yes, there is a lot we can do in encouraging and motivating voter education in a dispassionate way. And of course, the government will play its part in that. But I come back to the, the point I made that there is a consensus, a universal opinion in this parliament that we should have uh, that 16 and 17 year olds should be able to vote in all contests, but we don't have the legislative ability to put that into practice. Now, of course, we'll argue, and I'll, I'll happily sign, I'm sure the political leadership of the government will sign a letter with all the other political parties to the Prime Minister say, to say, look, we should have the franchise extended to 16 and 17 year olds. I'm all for that. We can all work together on that, but crucially, we can't control whether that happens or not. And that's one of the points of regret I have about the outcome of the referendum on Thursday, of course. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. Will he accept that uh, the election of a United Kingdom government next year that legislated for 16 and 17 year olds to have the vote would bring that benefit not just to Scotland, but to the rest of the UK as well? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, but, you know, but, yeah, of course it would. That's a statement of, of fact. But we, I'm only making the point that here we are, a bunch of grown up people elected by our, our electorate in Scotland to represent the interests of our country here and we can't take that decision. We've got to wait for somebody else to decide it's right to do so and that's just simply a point of regret that I have about the referendum last Thursday. Now one of the um, major points of debate uh, today has been about the, the whole focus on the issue of inequality that emerged in the referendum and none of us could have been uh, well, could have failed to have been struck by the amount of the debate that concentrated on the desire of individuals to tackle the issues of enduring inequality that have built up in our society. We debated endlessly before the referendum uh, that 
the argument point put forward by the government that the United Kingdom is the fourth most unequal country in the world. I seem to remember Mr Fraser and others would be taking issue with that point. But nonetheless, all of us, I think, would reflect the fact that inequality was a central part of the debate that we had during the referendum campaign. And I think it also had an effect on motivating very substantial turnouts from areas of the country that Sandra White, my friend and colleague, talked about, that George Adam talked about, that various other, that Bob Doris talked about, of very high levels of turnout from areas of the country that previously have not participated in elections or contests because they never saw any point in it. And why was that? Because they could see the opportunity of the referendum. Some of them may have been coming out to vote no, but many of them are coming out to vote yes. But crucially, lots and lots more of them that would normally not vote in electoral contests came out because they saw this as a means of addressing the inequality that exists within our society. Uh, of course. I think he makes a very serious point, but can I ask him why there was so little uh, redistributive policy within the White Paper then? Well, uh, I, uh, with, with the greatest of respect, Mr Finlay, uh, I'm trying to move the debate on to some of the issues that we... <laughs> Well, to, to move the debate on to some... Well, are we not supposed to be moving on positively, Mr Brown? I hear you guffawing, Mr Brown. I thought we were supposed to be moving on positively. But the point I'm making... The point I'm making is the fact that people were motivated by the desire to tackle those issues of inequality, and we as a parliament should take that message seriously in what we advance in the arguments that we take forward. Which left me somewhat bewildered by the contribution that Malcolm Chisholm made about essentially asking the government to do something to assess income inequality, if I understood him correctly, over which the government has a very little ability to affect issues of income inequality, but we do have issues, we do have the opportunity to assess the policy commitments that we make as a government through the equalities impact process which we undertake on an annual basis uh, as a government and I would have thought that would have been welcome to Mr Chisholm. I give Mr. Chisholm. We, briefly my point was in terms of all the policies of the government and indeed the legislation of the government to see what effect that has on various income groups and to what extent it is actually part of combating poverty. My, my whole point is that that is done by the equalities impact assessment of the government and I would have thought Mr Chisholm might have known that. Now, one of the other points that was made in the debate was about the importance of decentralising commitments to, uh, and, and provisions to different parts of the country. And Mr Chisholm criticised us again for apparently abolishing the Fair Scotland funds, which were all about tackling inequality. We didn't abolish the Fair Scotland fund. We, didn't. we devolved the Fair Scotland fund to local government, exactly yes. in the fashion, yes. exactly in the fashion that the Labour Party yep. demand that we decentralise yep. significant resources, £1 billion pounds of the Fair Scotland fund. We devolved it to local government, yep. exactly in the fashion that they asked for it, and they moan like Billy O about what we've actually done. So, um, Perhaps we would take it a little bit more seriously if it came in that fashion. Now, one of the other central points in the debate was the issue about the promise of more powers. And um, I set out in my earlier contribution the willingness of the Scottish Government to take part in the process that Lord Smith is presiding over and to give it a goodwill and commitment. <coughs> Dr Murray said that uh, David Cameron's attempts to link the Scottish process with the uh, process in England was ridiculous and unacceptable. And I agree with Dr Murray in that respect. But that rather explains why we were getting rather agitated over the weekend that there was some backsliding going on on the solemn commitments, the vow. We can't call it the pledge because the pledge is a somewhat devalued term in some parts of this parliamentary chamber. But that's why we were getting concerned about the danger of backsliding. It's maybe why Alistair Darling felt it necessary to say on television on Sunday, it was promised, it's got to be delivered, and anyone who betrays on that will pay a very heavy price for years to come. So it wasn't just the government, the Scottish government thinking that there was some backsliding going on. It was clear even in the heart of the Better Together campaign that there was backsliding going on. And that brings me on to the nature of what was promised, because Joan McAlpine went through all of this detail uh, very expertly in her contribution. Uh, in the course of the 
uh, the referendum campaign. We were promised Devo Max, we were promised Home Rule, we were to promised akin to federalism. Uh, call it what you want, it was an offer, a proposition of extensive powers, which is where Mr Carlo made a, a very helpful contribution. I never thought I'd live to see the day that I would say that about Mr Carlo. But Mr Carlo said that he was in, in, embarking on the discussions with Lord Smith from the position that the sum of the position was what had to be achieved out of Lord Smith's not work, not the divisions of the propositions that were being put forward. And I think that captures, in a sense, the point I was trying to get across in my earlier contribution. That if we go into this, trying to just tick a few boxes, get a bit of an agreement on uh, what powers might be transferred without thinking about those commitments that were made to the people of Scotland by the UK political parties, as Joe McAlpine talked about, without living up to the expectations that were delivered there, then the people who, the 85% of the population that came out to vote, the overwhelming majority of them who were voting in favour of more powers for this Parliament, the 45% that voted yes were clearly voting for more powers for the Parliament, but there would be a sizable proportion of those who voted no, as we have been told, a, a no vote was a vote for change as well, that these individuals were voting for extensive powers, then there is an overwhelming mandate in Scotland for extensive additional powers to be granted to this Parliament, and the Smith process, if it is to be successful, must fulfil those expectations across the political spectrum. So, uh, of course. Do, does he then disagree with his backbenchers who say the vow will not be honoured, the promises will not be delivered. Is it wrong to say that at this stage? Well, let's, 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 just, let's just let this process take its course. I've gone... Uh, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing with Mr Brown. What's he getting all agitated about? I don't know. This is... You see, Order. this is what... This is what... This is what, get, this is what gets me about parliamentary debates every so often. This is what gets me where the government is trying to advance an agenda which reflects the fact that we are trying to make genuine progress to address the need to strengthen the powers of the parliament. Why can't that be represented with some goodwill from the opposition parties rather than the sneering that we get all the time? Now, in the course of the referendum campaign, a lot was said about the National Health Service, and I want to say a couple of words about the National Health Service. On the 17th of September, the Labour Party tweeted to the assembled country, quotes, worried about the future of the NHS, it's safe with a no vote. On the 22nd of September, the Labour Party tweeted to the assembled masses, want to be part of saving the NHS, join Labour, it only takes three minutes. Now, the point I'd make about that is that the Labour Party embarked throughout a referendum campaign telling us that a no vote would secure the National Health Service, but yet we all know Andy Burnham is telling the country today that a no vote is delivering privatisation of the health service in exactly the way that we feared during the election campaign. Now, Mr Fitzpatrick said that I would set out to Parliament before I close details about the programme for government to respond to Mr Brown's point. Uh, the programme for government will be published once the new First Minister is elected. Uh, the government, and that has been conveyed to business managers today. I'd also say to Mr Brown that Scotland is open for business. It's always been open for business. The Chancellor came to Scotland, the Chancellor came to Scotland in 2011 and told us that Scotland would suffer because of having a referendum that there would be no in, that would inward investment would dry up in coming to Scotland. And since 2011, we have had record years of inward investment success. So the siren warnings yeah. about somehow the constitutional process undermining the economy of Scotland when, un when unemployment is falling, employment is a record high, economic inactivity is lower than the rest of the United Kingdom, all of these siren warnings have been to no avail given the economic performance of Scotland. Uh, I'll give away to Mr Malik. Mr Malik. Thank you very much for that. So what are you saying that Scotland has to be on pause again while the SNP gets its leadership into order? Have the we're, we're, 
we're, we're, we're, carry, we're carrying on doing all the things that we normally do, like expanding apprenticeships, delivering oh, childcare, abolishing prescription charges, uh, making sure the council tax is frozen, delivering free, uh, free education uh, for the higher education students. These are all the things this government has done in using the full powers of a devolved parliament as we are able to use them to deliver economic success for the people of our country. So, the Scottish Government's programme has been well set out to people in Scotland. We will, continue, we, will continue to, we will continue to implement the policy programme of the Government. We will set out our budget on the 9th of October, reaffirming our commitment that we've made to the people of Scotland that we will use the resources at our disposal to strengthen the Scottish economy, to ensure that we protect public services as, in, in the manner that we have done to date, that we ensure that we take forward the investment in the low carbon agenda and that we deliver on our commitments to the people of Scotland. The referendum last Thursday was an exercise in significant democratic participation in the well-being of the people of Scotland. The people came to their conclusion. This government accepts that conclusion. But what we will also do is continue to be ambitious for the people of Scotland to deliver the very best that we possibly can do. That's been at the heart of this government since 2007, and it will remain at the heart of this government. That concludes the debate on the First Minister's statement. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10978 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting up a revision to the business programme for tomorrow, Thursday the 25th of September. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10978. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10978 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to or well agreed. The next item of business consideration of a business motion 10979 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10979. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10979 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is decision time. There are no questions to be put as a result of today's business. So we now move swiftly on to members' business. Anybody who is leaving the Chamber should do so quickly and quietly.